Hey, how you doing? Good. Yeah, see you guys. Have a good day. How, how are you doing? Good. 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 Fly Machine Stories, Episode 3, with none other than Danny Laporte. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend. I thought he'd be the first. I know, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's not many people that can say they've done remotely half the stuff that you've done, so how'd you get here? How'd you get to that point? Like 67 or 68, my dad pulls up in a truck and it has a Montessa motorcycle in the back. You know, when you're a kid and you're in the desert and your dad puts you on the motorcycle, and I'm sure this has happened to a lot of people, once you get the throttle in the hand, you get the wind in your face yeah. in the desert, it's like, I'm in charge, right? There's so many stories. 1977, the famous story, Let Brock By. Yeah. Before my time, but everyone's seen the photo. I, that's, a, that's amazing that people are still talking about it yeah. to this day, you know. But it wasn't that moment why I lost the championship. It all was okay because I never really, I just looked at it, I screwed up, I lost the title. 1979, 500 US motocross champion. So how'd you go from a 125 to a 500cc title? A lot of guys didn't even want to ride the 500 class because they were so hard to ride, they had so much power. So after two years of losing the 125 class, I said, okay, just a change would be good. And it took me a year to figure it out. And right after I won the 500 class, I was already thinking of what can, else can I do? I wasn't, I'm not somebody that can go back and win a title the next year and then another year. I gotta move on. I gotta find something new to keep motivated. Look at Laporte, there he goes. In my mind, I was always thinking, win a title, then go to Europe, try to win a championship. As he's taken the lead away from I wanted to be the first to win a world title. We were still kind of the underdog. So in 79, I think, I ran over and I did like two international races. No one really knew this. Thrown in Belgium or a Dutch motocross race, sand, right, when yeah. it's raining, and four, 40 guys all going about the same speed is a nightmare of roost and muck yeah. in the air. It was an amazing thing. We did one race and then I did yeah. another race the next day somewhere else, you know, another international race. Yeah. And it was like, wow, this is, this is great. So you know? is that kind of how you got your name out in, in front of the uh, Europeans maybe a little a, bit? Maybe a little bit. Or was it more when you guys went over there in 81 and they saw that you could win on their that, turf? That's, that's when it all happened. Nineteen eighty-one, motocross of nations, That's part of right. Team USA. The U.S. was having a hard time to put a team together because no one wanted to do it. So we'll bring our total team: myself, Johnny O'Mara, Donnie Hansen, and Chuck Sun. I had no idea what I was doing, but I said, "I got to take this opportunity. I got to win a, a championship." And that was the first year that we'd ever won a championship at the Nations. 1982, 250 World Motocross Champion. First American to ever do so. No, actually, in that class. In that Lackey class. beat me the weekend before, though. Flash forward a little bit. Take me through how you go from motocross to wanting to become an off-road rider. When I was racing motocross GPs, I'd watch on TV Paris to the Car event. It's on national television. It's like Tour de France, you know? Yeah. So. I started to see like Gaston Raye on a BMW. You know, Gaston had gone from motocross, he started racing rallies. And he had Marlboro and BMW and Playboy sponsors. And I'm going, wow, what's, something's really going on in this world of off-road. And so I'm thinking, wow, this could be, this is kind of cool. I think I got to try this right away in my mind because I had, I grew up riding in the desert. And it was just so exciting to think about racing across Africa. I thought that was, now that's. That's an adventure. That's an adventure, yeah. The only guy I really knew was president of Yamaha France. He goes, you need to get some experience. So I did some six-day trials, I did other events, and we won the 1,000, we won the 500, three years in a row. 1988, 89, and 90, Baja 1000 champion. Yeah, finally he says, okay, I got a spot for you. 1990. I got some experience in, in the Pharaoh's Rally in Egypt. It's 11 days, it's a big race. It's, you know, 4,000 mile event. I got lost, I blew by checkpoints, I passed, you know, I did everything wrong you can possibly do, but I won, but you won. I won some stages yeah. in Pharaoh's Rally. So that, Yamaha was really happy about that. <laughs> then the second one was yeah. Dakar. There's video of you getting lost one day in like an African village. And <laughs> you're full just... panic. 
you're just like panicking, like riding around these straw huts. Oh God. And I was just like, whoa, yeah. like, okay, I get that they raced across Africa, but this is like Africa. Yeah. And on the seventh day in the country called Niger, the town Agadez, 14 days of my life were wiped clean. I crashed really high speed. And I had a lung contusion, heart contusion, I cracked my sternum. And I was bleeding internally in my lungs, I couldn't breathe. A helicopter flies in. They shoved a stent between my ribs so I could breathe. And then they flew me back with a medic to the, to the camp and then flew me back to Paris for the middle of North Africa. And I survived. That was my first real experience in Africa. So I said, I'll never do this again, I'm, I'm over it. We fly back to LA and I'm hanging out. Weeks go by, days go by, I'm starting to get a little itch. And then all of a sudden, I go, I gotta do this again. Oh no. <laughs> and that's what Georgia said, oh no. So my first race back was the Pharaoh's Rally in Egypt. 11 days, huge event. And I won that I was so focused because of the crash before, I outfocused everybody. Yeah. I had a, the same mindset going into Dakar. You get second. Yeah. Which still holds your name in the record books as the highest placing American to ever finish Dakar. Still live sleep on that. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, that's, that's right. The very next year, the money kind of just dried up. And I had to say, you know, no, there's a certain risk limit that I have. It has to be a number in your brain to make it all the worthwhile. And mentally, your attention has kind of maybe shifted a bit. Shifted. I mean, then, then that's when it gets really and dangerous. That's exactly what happened. That's so. me. That's really me. I had to retire. And I think to cap that off, being inducted into the Hall of Fame in 2000. Yeah. Here's to uh, one heck of a career. Thank you. Getting to uh, be able to live part of it. I mean, that's pretty cool. You still love to ride. Yeah. I mean, you ride all the time. I enjoy riding trails and riding technical stuff, and I learn a little, watch a video, Graham Jarvis something, and, and then I try to go out and imitate it. And it was fun, it's a good challenge, you know. We rode probably uh, 23, 24 days this year with Donnie. Yeah. Your father. Yeah. And. Uh, your dad, you know, he rides really well. I mean, he's improved so much just trail riding in the last 15, 20 years since we've been riding together. Yeah. It's unlimited what you can do. God, it's, yeah. it's such a complete it's sport, like you know? Like, like, it's that moment when I was a kid. You yeah. get on it, you turn the throttle. It's the best. You know when you, when you cheer somebody? It goes to look in the eye. Always. Got it. Dang it. You did for a second. For a second, I give you a split second plan. <laughs>